seara. O avem alături pe Ruth Beckerman. Beckerman, thank you so much for coming and sharing your films with us. Or four of your films. For this... Four? Yes. In this retrospective. First retrospective in Romania of your films. Of your work. Um, e ok dacă facem discuția în engleză? So I would have a first question and then maybe we will pass to the to the audience. Um, in fact, you have started filming in '86 during the elections without the purpose of making a film then, but you went back to this footage 30 years later. For what reason could you tell us? Yeah, it's. <coughs> Actually, everybody asked me this question already, and I don't have a real answer because it just happened by chance that I. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I took this. Um, actually, the, the the material survived only on VHS cassettes, and. <coughs> At a certain point, it was transferred to CDs. And in 2013, I watched these CDs with some Watch these CDs with uh, some young people, <coughs> and um, I took two airplanes today. Maybe that's the reaction now. Thank you. So, as I said, I watched this material after many years, 30 years and more, <coughs> with some young people. And they, who didn't even know who Mr. Waldheim was, have been very shocked by what they saw. And me, myself, I was much more shocked than at the time, because at the time you were used to this kind of anti-Semitism and kind of nasty talk in the streets. And, well, this was in 2013 that I watched the material and these young people, they asked so many questions and they said, you must make a film about it. And they talked about Nixon, who was also lying and had to resign. And um, so, in the beginning I said, why should I make a film? I was there at the time, so I know everything. But then I thought, actually, I knew only what was transmitted in Austria. Because at the time there was no internet and no satellites. So, you, and when you're an activist like myself, and uh, you're in the middle of something, you don't know the broader picture. So I got interested in, in, in going to the American and British and French archives and watch, uh, put the whole affair in an international context. This was my purpose. But when I started doing research, I thought I'd make a small film just for Austria. And then I stopped uh, working on it and made another film and continued only in 2015. And all of a sudden with the election of Trump and, you know, the changes in politics, international politics, uh, the topic became so timely. And, yeah, this was not my intention actually. 
But you, you also reacted probably to what was happening in Austria with the election of... Uh, no, because no. the election was in 2017. Okay, so earlier. So, yeah, that's what I say. Uh, in 2017 we were still editing the film and all of a sudden the film became so, yeah, timely. Unfortunately, I must say, in a way. It's good for the film, but it's not so good for politics, maybe. So, if there's questions... No, no, but it's good for the others to, to hear you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Beckerman, thank you so much for being here, first of all. Willkommen. And uh, as we live in the context of post-truth and fake news and all of that in mass media, sadly, uh, my question is very simple and very direct for you as a filmmaker and as an activist. How long does it take, how much time does it have to pass for a people and for a country to forget? A generation to generation to forget. To, to forget, forgive or to forget? To forget, to forget uh, the to forget. past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in Austria they forgot immediately. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't forget. They rewrote memory. I mean, you all, I think, um, you all, memory is a construction and you change this narrative um, almost every day, even in your own life. You would um, speak about things that happened 10 years ago in a different way now and in, than five years ago. So, um, what Austria did was to construct a narrative which was a lie, that they have been the first victim of the German Nazis, and this lie was very uh, profitable for Austria. Uh, they didn't have to pay reparations as the Germans had to, and um, tourists came to lovely Austria, and. Um, while they spoke of the ugly Germans, so it had a good reason. And I think for Mr. Waldheim, uh, as we saw in the film, he could make a big career by uh, lying about a couple of years of his life. So it took about 40 years that this lie collapsed. But I think a country pays a big price for living under this um, glass jar of a taboo. And because I remember that before the Waldheim affair, the atmosphere in Austria was very numb. You know, I mean, people didn't only, uh, there was not only silence about the involvement in the Nazi period, but the whole society was like uh, uh, not very, um, how would you say, yeah, numb, uh, stupid in a way. <laughs> and uh, after this Weitem affair, Austria changed for the better because people started to discuss the past and people started to become much more open-minded in in every sense of, of in, in many, many aspects. So how was the process of uh, making the film after you started looking into the international archives and getting this picture of uh, what the Waldheim affair meant for the, for the US and uh, all the connections in, uh, in America? What were the, the, the other steps? Well, of course I had an enormous amount of material and in the beginning I wanted to make a kind of epos to have flashbacks into other scandals which happened in Austria before the Waldheim affair and so it was like a very broad picture I wanted to paint. And then at a certain point I thought, no, I mean, you have to make a film and you don't write a history book. 
So I decided to concentrate on these three months of election campaign, like a calendar, like a chronology. Uh, and at the same time, this allowed me to have excursions into themes that um, were important for me. Like the question, why didn't it, it happen earlier? Why didn't the world speak about the Holocaust and what happened to the Jews and the Roma and other victims of the Nazis earlier? but only in the mid-80s. So as you have seen in the film, there's this one excursion about Reagan in Bitburg and the film Shoah by Lanzmann. So I think it only started with this American series Holocaust in 79, 1979, that the focus, uh, the international focus, or focus in the Western world, let's say, uh, shifted um, from talking about the war and the resistance movements um, to the victims of, like the Jews and so on. Yeah, so um, uh, this, this uh, concept of sticking to the, um, this, this chronology of three months made it possible to leave the chronology and come back easily. You didn't have to explain why you are now back in the narration of the campaign. So this was the final concept I decided in the editing room. After watching all these hundreds of hours of footage <laughs> with my editor, I must say. And, um, but it uh, happens many times with documentaries, I think, that uh, you write the film a third time in the editing room. You write it first when you write the treatment, and then you shoot the film, and you have another, you, another, you have material. You confront yourself with reality, and then you rewrite the concept. You write a new concept. The French call it la troisième écriture. So um, it's, it's quite common that this happens. Așa vă iau o întrebare pentru doamna Mănește, puteți să o traduceți. Dacă consideră că în perioada când a fost secretar general al ONU, domnul Valhar a făcut ceva pozitiv pentru Austria și pentru politica mondială și de asemenea în comparație poate cu perioada când a fost dânsul secretar general, la ora actuală, dacă consideră că ONU este la fel de puternică sau importantă ca în perioada respectivă. Adică ideea este dacă tu te-ai făcut ceva I think Weitem was not so important. I mean, he was the general secretary, but he was, he had to do what the member states decided on. And of course, this was the period of decolonization and of many new member states in the UN, the African states and so on. So there was quite a strong sentiment at the time against uh, Israel, and that's why, and I think he, all, he also had his friends in the Arab world, <clears throat> and I'm sure that part of this conflict, or part of the reasons why the World Jewish Congress um, attacked him finally, was also to find a way to attack the politics of the UN in the 70s. But um, one cannot blame him for the politics because he was <laughs> acting as, uh, as the members wanted him to act. Um, I think the UN was much more important at the time than today. But uh, that's another film. Is a character in the film uh, a character, a political personality from Lantos? 
who was in the 90s, a sort of, uh, in Romania, seen as a sort of precursor of uh, George Soros now. He played the same role, you know, the bad Hungarian Jew, really, yeah. Because he had some uh, positions against, you know, the forgetfulness of the Romanian establishment. And uh, he was uh, visiting the country, I think. And, uh, but he's now forgotten, you know, and I was, uh, you know, it brought me some uh, mm -hmm. memories. But this, this, you know, role model of the Hungarian Jew that uh, Orban, Viktor Orban is now constructing in, in Hungary with Soros was already in the books mm -hmm. by then. So there's a lot of replicas like this in your, uh, in your story. That, uh, mm -hmm. It's not a, only a story about Austria and Palestine. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a strong thing. I mean, for me, the <clears throat> And the film traveled a lot last all the year of 2018. And it was very interesting for me that in the different countries, people very much discussed their own situation. <laughs> because actually my main focus was to show that the mechanism, how you can win elections is always the same. I mean, you create an enemy in this case, it was the, the Jews and America and so on. And our, last, our present government won the, ele won the elections uh, by creating an enemy in the foreigners, the migrants, and the refugees, you know. So you can create this uh, patriotism very easily. So I tried to make the film uh, in a way that you could uh, understand the system. I don't know if this... Um, what do you think about that? Bună seara, am și o întrebare, am văzut orez. Ce se întâmplă cu cei care, politicienii care l-au susținut astăzi, în 2000, no, I suppose that the politicians who were sustained at that time, what have they done, or what situation are they in today, in the moment of the face, the ones who were sustained to prestige the presidency of Austria? I think it was a political movement that sustained. Ah, well, that was the conservative party, and of course the protagonists are dead today, most of them. But uh, this party is in power now and forms a coalition with the extreme right party. Uh, but you know, this party never made research or reflected about its past. So they don't talk about Vita much. Um, but um, I think what happened to the, happens today is much more dangerous because at the time we were concerned about uh, the past to finally get rid of this lie about Austria being a victim. And uh, in the end, we won. Because even if he was elected, he was isolated, nobody came to visit him, he was not invited anywhere. And big discussions started in Austria and the country changed for the better, in my opinion. And what happens today, since we have this government, is that they try to um, change our present time and our future in a way which is very much backwards in many, many respects. I mean, of course, they would never say that Austria was a victim. This is over. Everybody acknowledges that Austria was guilty as much as the Germans. But at the same time, what is very nasty and horrible is that they use the memory of the Holocaust to uh, be better rac racists. I don't know if I want to explain that because that's important. That they uh, use this memory in saying um, we have to, to defend the Judeo-Christian 
Europe against these Muslims who import anti-Semitism and so on, which is just the generalizations and creating another enemy by embracing the Jews or trying to embrace the Jewish com small Jewish community of Austria. And that's what they are doing today. I don't know if I made myself clear. But for the moment, for the time being, the Jewish community still resists this, this embracement. <laughs> but that's the idea, and I think that's very ugly to use uh, the horrors which have happened to be a better racist today. În cursul documentării am găsit vreo explicație pentru care blocul sovietic nu a făcut un punct de propagandă din împotriva împotriva vestului pentru că a ales un președinte și un secretar general cu trecut nazist. În România, în, înainte de 89, aproape nu s-a vorbit, dar cred că s-a menționat în teatru. Deci, pe de din 89, nu mai mult. Dacă a fost probabil și așa așa de mici, probabil știau de lucrul lui. But I suppose you knew, uh, yeah, about the Soviets. Yeah, if they made any... Poate ei știau ceva și l-au șantajat, altfel nu mi-a explicat pentru care... Deci, în anii 80, când a fost lupta pentru pace dusă la maxim în România, se punea accentul pe organizațiile neonaziste. Da? Știm foarte bine cine a fost de ce a vorbit despre... Inclusiv, Kraftwerk era considerat o formare de neonaziste. Nu înțelegem întrebarea asta. De ce? Dacă a întâlnit în documentarea Dânsei, e o explicație pentru care blocul sovietic nu a, nu a, nu a făcut un punct de propagandă din asta. Well, you know, this is a question I cannot answer because actually we don't really... One has to do research in Soviet and uh, former Yugoslavian archives. Because, of course, I'm sure, and all the historians say so, that the Soviets and Tito, of course, knew about uh, Valtan, everything, where he has been and how much he was involved in during the war. And, but one should go to the archives and, I mean, I tried uh, the film archives in Belgrade and Zagreb and they said they don't have any material, but I'm sure there are documents and one has to dig if one is interested to find out. Um, there are rumors going around that the Yugoslavs and the Soviets blackmailed him because they knew. Maybe, I mean, but there's no proof, so I didn't want to touch this subject, because that's another film, maybe. Uh, what is pr uh, true is that his closest collaborator in the UN was from Yugoslavia. Well, make of it whatever you want. You know? <laughs> care a apărut în documentare. Ar fi fost posibil înainte de cazul Valheim? No, ok, you're right, that's a good question, because uh, <coughs> only, I mean, you couldn't believe it today, but I grew up in Austria, and nobody in Austria talked about uh, the Jews as victims, and um, of course not about everything they robbed from the Jews. Uh, because, you know, it would have been illogical if Austria was a victim, so how can the, whose victims have, have the Jews been, you know, it was not possible. So only after the Waldheim affair all this started, and um, in, uh, only in two, around the year 2000, they made a law to give back some artwork and, and this restitution of art started. 
So it took a very long time um, to give back some of the of the goods that belong to to the Jewish uh, people in Austria. I want to briefly advertise another film of yours that is showing uh, tomorrow evening at 8:30. It's called East of War, and it's a very special film filmed in an exhibition that shows the atrocities committed by the, the Wehrmacht uh, and also the Austrian contingent in the Wehrmacht. So check this tomorrow at 8.30. And also, since we're talking about victimization of nations, and uh, you know, there's no nation who hasn't done that. The Romanians are doing it, even the Russians are doing it. And tomorrow, uh, Jan Boruma has picked a film that we're showing the Chagrin La Pitié, Marcel Ophel's uh, masterpiece, that is talking about the way the French have dealt with this, uh, with this collaboration and uh, with the Nazis. Yeah, maybe I say a word about the East of War. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I try for all of my films, and you show four of them, to pick another form a documentary form or kind of essay form. Um, in this film there was a voiceover. There's a film uh, where that might be interesting for you because there's uh, some pieces of the footage I shot during the Waldheim affair I already used in this other film called Paper Bridge, which is an essay film partly shot in the northern part of Romania. Um, following, it's a film about Jewish identity of my generation, uh, thinking about what had happened, thinking about where our parents came from. My father came from Romania, and um, it's a film about, yeah, it's, it's an essay film. And this film, East of War, is a very straight documentary. Uh, shot in one space, an exhibition about the crimes of the Wehrmacht, which was shown in 1996. And this was, you know, till, 1990, till this exhibition, in Germany and in Austria, the saying was that the SS were the bad guys and the Wehrmacht was clean and not guilty at all. So this exhibition with more than 1,000 photographs showed how much the Wehrmacht was involved in the crimes committed in Eastern Europe. And I made this film in the, this exhibition. And I think it's, it's happened 10 years after Waldheim. And it was another step in the direction of uh, coming to terms with the past, actually. So it might be interesting maybe for you. Surely. And I'm sorry we have to wrap it now, but uh, the only thing that is good is that you'll be back tomorrow for the, the second screening of Welcome Waltz and uh, for the screening of uh, East of War and then uh, Monday and Tuesday for the rest of the screenings. So thank you so much for being here and for the <laughs>